in today's show. It's the Boston Celtics Fantasy Preview Show. Information on how to join the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl as well, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. So, did an Atlanta Hawks season preview show yesterday and announced the details for the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl. We're going to talk about that more in today's show. Warney. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> All right. The response was amazing. So many people sent in emails. Um, a couple of things that I needed to stress. I've got all the details up. If you are tuning in for the first time today, we are running a contest. It is a 360-team league category league and a 360-team league points league. 30 divisions of 12 teams. There's slow drafts. There's $25 entry. In the end, the top two from each division go through to a final 60-team week where you win the total prize of $4,500. Um, a couple of things I should have mentioned. The the answers or the applications I get are not going to be announced first come, first served. So when the show goes out, you will have a probably around a 24-hour period um, where I will go through and email these. It might be a little bit longer. So don't stress that you're a little bit late. If you listen to this a day later, there will be... Um, there will be, what's his name? Um, you know, delays in getting those out. It won't be just first in, first first dressed. I, I, I could do it and really encourage you to watch as soon as the show drops, but I'm not doing it that way. Secondly, you can only enter one division. You can enter a categories one and a points one, but I'm not going to give out entries. You'll be in the Hawks one. You'll be in the Celtics one. You'll be in the Pacers one. It's, it's one each, right? You get one category team. You can get one points team. That is it. If you did enter for the Hawks division, and you didn't get in, you have to enter again for the Celtics one. You have to just throw that in because there's going to be different answers. And I want to try and get, it's not just like, hey, I've thrown an email out there and it broadly covers the whole league. I want to get people in and interacting and, and doing that stuff. In terms of the people that I chose to be in that league, um, it was just a mix. Sometimes it was random. Sometimes people put a funny anecdote in their email. So I just read through all of them. And found ones went, ah, you seem like you'd be interesting. So when you're throwing your entry in there, put something in there. Reminder, later in the show, there will be the mandatory answer that you need to give to get in. So you email lofbbowl at gmail.com. In the subject line, you write Celtics and whether you want to be category league. So you'd write Celtics cats if you want to be in the category league or Celtics points if you want to be in the points league. Um, and then there will be an answer that I give later in the show that you have to include in the body of that email, plus whatever else you want to include in the body of that email. Rules will be linked in the description below. And I reckon that's probably enough on the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl. Remember, though, it is not first come, first served. Um, get your entries in and keep going. We'll see. We've got, we've filled up. The, the Hawks leagues are filled up, by the way. They are fill, uh, filled. They are, they are full at this point. Um, and we'll keep going to fill out the other 29 of the other NBA teams. So let's now take a look at the Boston Celtics for this upcoming season. What does their schedule look like? How does that play out? We've got 54 quality games. And yesterday I said it was uh, eight games or fewer when I look at quality games. I actually look at nine games or fewer, so apologies for that uh, misinterpretation. The Celtics have more quality games than other teams. 54 of them they have, meaning that, again, the later round guys that you get, it's a little bit more value because you're not going to be forced into as many start-sit decisions 
with these players and even the top end guys. It just helps to have them playing on the lower volume days versus on the 13 game Wednesdays and 12 game Fridays. They're generally the days that stink is those big Fridays, big Wednesdays, sometimes big Saturdays and occasionally big Sundays where you've got 11 teams playing and you've got to make a decision whether you're between your 10th and 11th guy as to which guy you start or sit. That's where the problem lies with that. They have 13 back-to-backs, which is marginally below average. The back-to-backs is average about 13.2. So it's not a big difference there. And in terms of playoff schedule, they do have a really nice playoff schedule. If you end your playoffs when I suggest that you end your playoffs, you don't have to do that. This is what I would suggest. March the 19th is when you end. The three weeks prior to that, it's 4-3-4, four, four, so it's 11 games. But if you go one week later... They only play 10 games. That's the March 26th playoffs. That's a 3-4-3 for that. And then the April 2nd playoffs, it is also just 10 games. That's Yahoo default, where it's a 4-3-3 schedule. So not ideal for this Boston Celtics team, who projects to be one of the best teams in the NBA this season. So what are we looking at? What are the interesting pressure points on projections? Well, the arrival of Malcolm Brogdon is something we need to pay attention to. I'll talk about Brogdon a little bit more. But is there any impact on, say, a Jalen Brown, because we know that Brogdon started his career as a shooting guard, became a point guard in Indiana, but he can play off ball. Is there any impact on Marcus Smart? I tend to think marginal, if none. That's, That's my general thought on that. I think that Smart, Brogdon, and Brown can all play together, especially now with the injury to Danilo Gallinari. Push Tatum up to the four a little bit more, Brown at the three, Brogdon at the two, Smart at the one. So... If there's going to be an impact, it'll be on Smart rather than Brown. And maybe there is just a marginal impact on Smart. But Marcus Smart is so important to this team. People just thought immediately, well, Brogdon's in. He's a better player than Smart because he averages more points. Therefore, he's going to be their starting point guard. And that is just not going to be the case. Malcolm Brogdon will come off the bench. He might play 30 minutes. He might not. He might play 27. Right? But he's not replacing Marcus Smart. But there might be a bit of a hit to Smart. There's still enough playing time, though, for Smart to do similar to what he did last season. Brogdon, I think, is the one out of those two, Smart and Brogdon, who is going to take the bigger hit. But I could be wrong. Maybe they play Smart 30 minutes and Brogdon plays 31. I really doubt that. But maybe they do it. How do they replace the Italian cock? I'm not going to get to play this sound drop much this season, so let's just you know, salute it one last time. Hands off my cock! Because Dylan Gallinari has torn his ACL. He will not play this season. He was a big addition for them. Not that he's a great player at this point in his career, but he's pretty bloody useful as a backup forward. And now their backup forwards are, I mean, it's Grant Williams and then it's Sam Hauser, Luke Cornett, Noah Vonley, Jake Lehman. Yes, Jake Lehman is on this team. Like It's rough. And that's why I think you'll see more Tatum at the four, Brown at the three, because they've got an abundance of guards. Brogdon, Derek White, Peyton Pritchard off the bench. So you can shift those guys all up a little bit. That's how I think they replace Gallinari. It's not by giving huge minutes to Sam Hauser or Luke Cornett. It's by going smaller and running Brown at the three versus Brown at the two because you've got good guards and bad forwards on the bench. Jason Tatum struggled efficiency-wise to begin last season, but he was really good in the second half of the season. There's not usually a linear carryover of second-half numbers carrying into the next season. We tend to think of it as, well, he was struggled early on, he figured it out, and that's what will happen as we move forward. I know Kevin Pelton's done a lot of work on this, especially with young players, and it's not always, it doesn't just carry over that way. Generally, if they have this big surge second half, the numbers tend to come down a little bit the next season. Maybe not to what they were at the beginning of the season, because we always have, there's always slumps, there's always rises. And when you rise, it doesn't mean you rise and you stay there forever and just keep going or going up, because you can come back down. So I think people are looking at what Tatum did with that really big bump in efficiency and looking and go, I'll take him in the top four now. I've seen him go at three or two in drafts because, oh, look, he figured it out. And he did shoot better, but it doesn't mean that that continues all the way through. If it does, then he's a great sort of top five option. I don't think that is where I I wouldn't take him in the top five. I know that. But in some leagues at at seven or eight, you you can consider that. But just be careful of looking at him and go, well, I know he's going to stay healthy because you don't. And I know that efficiency is going to stick because you don't know that either. And they are two things that people will burn into their brains about Jason Tatum and go, well, this is, that's why I'll pick him at three. Because, you know, it doesn't get hurt. Again, don't know that. 
and efficiency was great second half. He, he really picked it up. Again, you don't know that. You don't know that that sticks. In fact, in general, that will wax and wane. That will go up and down. And there is he doesn't have a history of doing that at that level for long term versus you know, doing it for two months or 25 games or whatever the timing was on that for um, old mate Jason Tatum. Guys, better line. It is the number one spot for all of your pro and college football betting needs. Find all the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including all of the week two NFL action. I'm recording this just before Chargers and Chiefs to kick off week two. We've got other, all the week two games are up there. Let's see what's an interesting game. The Jets and the Browns. Who's interested in that one? Big Jacoby Brissett fans. The Browns are six and a half point favorites. Or you could look to the um, Seahawks, who are eight and a half point underdogs after their upset win against the Denver Broncos in week one. All of that information is available at Bet Online. It's your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And you can, it's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports and events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet Online is where the game starts. Who's the most valuable player in the NBA? Steph, Jokic, LeBron, Giannis, Doncic. Which player moves the betting lines the most? Locked on and bet online, they present the NBA top 50 most valuable players starting on September the 19th. You can find it on the Locked On NBA feed on uh, YouTube or wherever you get podcasts. So the next segment that I like to do here is just actually one quick correction. I said about Tatum top five. In, in a Roto League, I would consider him a top five guy. I, I would consider that in, in top five. I had it in my first round picks of the day that I would look at him as a top, as maybe the fifth or sixth guy in a Roto League. So just to clarify, head to head, I wouldn't. In Roto, I probably would. Just a clarification on that. Um, I, I don't talk Roto much because Roto is like less than 10% of the fantasy market. Head to head categories is like 60. Points is like 30 and um, Roto is like 10. So I don't talk too much about Roto. Same as like, I don't talk too much about auction values because it's like 8%, I think, of fantasy drafts are done that way. And it's really hard to you know, provide... I can say this guy might go up pick 70, and that holds true for 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 team leagues. If I say he goes for 40 bucks, that is literally only specific to a 12-team league with a $200 budget. So you have a 10-team league or a 14-team league or a 16-team league or a roster size changes, that number is completely meaningless. So that's why I tend to do those things, the way I do them. Anyway, breakout candidates. There's not many, is there? Like, it's, there's not many. Maybe it's Grant Williams, who might be forced into a larger role. But Gallinari wasn't there last season. They were dealing with like Daniel Tice was getting some of those minutes. So maybe there is a little bit more playing time for Grant Williams, who I think is a good player. Shot out of his brain last season. Is that real? Can he continue to be a 90-plus percent free throw guy and hit uh, threes at like 40%? I'm not certain about that. Like, can he actually be better than last season, Grant? Can he be better enough that he's an impact fantasy guy? I, I would suggest no. Like, I, I don't think he gets it. Like, he was 208th in category leagues last season, Grant Williams. He was 274th in points leagues. I do think he can jump up, maybe knock in the top 200 of cats, maybe knock to the top 225 in points. But I don't know that he gets much further than that. I just don't think he's got the usage game. I don't think he's got the big assists or big rebounds. He's not generating at this point big defensive stats. So while the role might be bigger, I'm not sure he's an actual breakout guy. And then I've got, you know, Sam Hauser, Fiundo Cabangele, who is, Cabangele is the best fantasy player to those guys. If you played them equal minutes, he's a guy that can rack up numbers. But I just don't know how much he's going to play. There is an opening there at backup power forward where I said it could be, you know, Williams is going to get his minutes, but it could be Cornette, Hauser, Vonley, Cabangale, Lehman. Who knows which of those guys make the roster, if any of them, or some of them will. Yeah, Cabangale is on a two ways. He's going to make it, but Lehman's sort of battling with Bruno Caboclo or Noah Vonley for that last roster spot. Hauser's an interesting one. He can be a really good shooter, can be a stretch guy, probably mimics what Gallinari can do the, the most as a shooter. Um, he's not the same player. He's not as good as Gallinari, obviously, but a younger guy, they've got a little bit of faith in. He's just one to watch, I think, Sammy Hauser for deeper formats. That's probably about it, though. Let's look at sleepers. This is really, this is more, more for category leagues, but I think Rob Williams, as I've talked about on other shows, I think he's a little bit undervalued. At Yahoo, he's at 36. 
I would go a little bit earlier than that. But Fantrax at 46 and ESPN at 58, that is way too low. Yes, he had injuries in the playoffs. And that is really screwed with people's minds a lot, thinking that he's missed so much time. He was basically at the same games played as uh, Luka Doncic and you know, four or five fewer games than Giannis last season. He played 64 or 65 games at 30 minutes a pop. Like, that's, that's really good, obviously. He was the 20, 29th ranked player last season on a per-game basis. If you do include clue turnovers, you should not, because it skews the value. It makes him like 15th. And you would never, ever, 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 ever consider him a second-round player or even a close to a first-round guy. He's not that. Don't get it skewed. He is not that. All right, he is a late second, probably more early third or mid third round player. But the value you're getting of ADP 58 on ESPN and 46 on Fantrax is really, really strong. There are some injury problems. He had toe and knee problems and a lot of lower body stuff. And he's not going to play 75 games. I wouldn't have thought. But I don't think he comes in and he just pencils him in for 50. I think in deeper formats, there's not many other guys that are listed as... Um, or I think are you know, significant sleeper value type players. Peyton Pritchard in deeper leagues is. Anytime I see someone who I think is going to be a regular rotation player who's ranked outside the top 300, my eyes go, hey, that doesn't sound right, does it? Pritchard was 345th last season. I think he's going to have an opportunity to be much better this season. Again, with the injury to Gallinari, his shooting is going to be important and Brogdon and Brown and Smart can push up lineups more. This is only for deeper leagues like 20-teamers. But Pritchard probably should be someone that goes off the board in a 20-team league. In a points league, his value is about the same as it is in a category league, around that 220 to 250 mark, not the 340 that he was last season. I think he, can be, he only played 14 minutes a night last season because they were pretty stacked. And they've got a lot of guards again, but just with the lack of forwards, I think they're going to go with more guard-heavy lineups to really help his overall value. Now, on the flip side of things, this is a very public team. And in betting parlance, that means it's a team that casuals like. It's a team that people tend to really get involved in because they're historic. They've won so many titles. They made the NBA Finals last season. So they get overvalued. And that's where we head to fantasy busts. Because there's a big, there's a lot of names on this list. Jalen Brown is ranked 36 on Yahoo, 42 on ESPN, 41 on Fantrax. He was 51st last season. I think he's around that same mark. Yes, if you punt free throws, he can jump up somewhat. Somewhat, but to third round? I don't think so. Like that that doesn't seem it doesn't seem right to me. In fact, when I look at my minus one ranks, he actually drops a little bit. Because there's other players who have more specific strengths that jump ahead of him. And he just doesn't what's his strength? It's points. That, that's really good. Um but thirty six is too high. Forty two and forty one is getting closer, but I think it's too high. I would not look at Jalen Brown as a third-round player. In points leagues, you can consider that. He was 39th last season, so he's not really a bust in a points league. Uh, That's about right. In a category league, it's too high. And again, it's why it's understanding what ADP means, understanding how that's calculated or or what it entails, that it's not draft format specific. So certain players will be boosted, certain players will be lowered across different formats. All right, here's your answer. Entry to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl. Put this answer in the um, in the body of the text. Jalen Brown averaged 37.4 Yahoo Fantasy points per game last season. So just drop that in there. Jalen Brown averaged 37.4 fantasy points. That is your answer when you send your email off to lofbbowl at gmail.com with either Celtics Cats or Celtics Points in the header. That is what you put in. Um, Marcus Smart, 65 on fan tracks. Seems pretty aggressive. So I'm just going to turn my phone off so the ringtone doesn't go off. 65 on fan tracks. That ADP is too high. Marcus Smart was 73rd in category leagues last season. He was 90th in points leagues. I don't see him getting better than what he was last year with the addition of Brogdon, with the full season of Derek White. Um, No, no way am I taking him at 65. It's too high. His ADP is 86 on Yahoo. It's about right. It's 93 on ESPN. It's about right. 65 is not close to right. Malcolm Brogdon is too high. 90 on Yahoo. 69 on ESPN. Giggity. What? That, that, that's obviously crazy. Now, he was 49th on a per-game basis in category leagues last season, Brogo. He played 34 minutes. He also got hurt a lot. 
He's not doing that. He's not playing 34 minutes a night. He's not going to be a top 50 player. I, I don't even know if he's a top 100 guy. The 90 is okay. I, I still wouldn't do it. But 69, no way I would do 69. There's, there's no way. There's no way I'd pick him there. And Derek White. I, I, I like Derek White as a player, as, you, as you're all well aware. Maximum Derek. I'm not drafting him at 103. That's insanity. I'm not drafting him at 135 even. Like, when I talk about guys that can be busts, if you're ta- picking them in the last round in 140 to 156, okay. All right, whatever. Who cares? 103 is round nine. Round nine? Yeah, round nine. No way. 128 on Yahoo, that's like round 11. No, too early. 135, that's round 11 as well. It's, it's, it's too early for a guy that is the second backup point guard, the backup shooting guard, who might not crack 25 minutes a night, despite how good I think he is. He's just, he's just look, it's, it's rationality. He's not going to get that playing time. He's not going to get that opportunity to be that good. There's no way you want to draft him in that area. I, I just don't get it. And then, because ADP is, can be quite category specific, Rob Williams at 36, which was a gr- it's a pretty good value in a category league. In a points league, it's bad. You, you don't want anything to do with him at 36. He was 62nd in a points league. You don't want anything to, even on his, his fan tracks ADP is like 46. It's too high in a points league. It's a big difference between his points league value and his category league value. So he's a bust in a points league. I think Al Horford in a points league with a Yahoo 93, fan tracks 98, ESPN 95 ADPs is too high in a points league. Horford was 86th in points leagues last season, averaging almost 30 fantasy points. I think the 29 minutes he plays goes to 28 or 27. They're a little bit more cautious with what he does. He also was able to like double his block rate almost last season and put together some really big numbers. And I'm not sure at age 36 that we expect that to maintain, if not come down. So I just wouldn't, I wouldn't be wasting this. Maybe it's not a waste. I, I, I think it is. I wouldn't be wasting like a round eight pick on Al Horford in a, in a points league specifically. Get him in round 10. It's good value, especially in a, cat, in a category as well. Round eight. Mm, I don't think so. Let's look at some upside flyer picks. Guys, you might pick in the last round of a 12-team league. I don't think there's anyone. I think Brogdon you take in like round 11, round 10 maybe, probably round 11. Oh, yeah, round 10, it's fine. If you're looking for a point guard, no worries. I don't even think... I might take Derek White in the, in the last round, but he's, according to ADP, he's been selected by then. I wouldn't take Grant Williams there. I wouldn't take Peyton Pritchard there. And everyone else is going to get drafted. There's not one player that I really look at on this team and go, yeah, there's a real chance he blows up. I don't, and maybe it's Grant, but I don't really think it is. So I did this a little bit different on yesterday's show, the Hawks show. That's how we're going to do it now. Let's just look at the whole roster. Marcus Smart. Projected starting, Smart, Brown, Tatum, Horford, Williams. Marcus Smart, I think, is a guy we look at as a 80 to 95 player in category leagues. We look at as a 90 to 110 player in points leagues. We talked about his bust and sleeper value already. Jalen Brown, probably a little bit overvalued. He's like a 50 to 60 guy. Jason Tatum is a first round player. His roto value is more than his head to head value. We spoke about that already. His points league value is, it's okay. It's back end first round. He's in that, you know, 7 to 11, 7 to 12 range. But he's also one of those guys that part of the reason you're bumping him is you think he stays healthy. So if he misses 20 games or 15 games, then that per game value is not really where it needs to be, I don't think. And that's a problem. Al Horford, as I just mentioned, I think the value drops a little bit with him. He plays a minute fewer. Um, He's a year older like we all are, but he's 36. He was great last year, 60th in categories. I, I don't really see that continuing. And then Rob Williams, who, again, depending on your format, is up and down, isn't he? I, I would look at him, as I mentioned, early third round. Debate between him and Gobert. How do you, much do you want to protect your free throw percentage? He's a better free throw shooter than Gobert. Better assist guy than Gobert as well. Then you've got the bench. Brogdon, who is, you know, point guards can be hard to find. But if it's like him or Trey Jones that I'm looking at in round nine or 10, I take Trey Jones. I don't mind Brogdon if I really do need that help later on because there's just not that many guys. But Brogdon or Fultz, I'd probably take Fultz. I think there's higher upside in him. Because I just, it requires injury and not injury to Brogdon for him to push into that value. 
Derek White, I don't actually think he's a 12-team league guy. But if he was in the last round, I might consider it. Then you've got Grant Williams and Peyton Pritchard. That's probably the main nine rotation guys. Grant can be an, an okay guy at maybe some blocks, but his overall fantasy game lacks. And Pritchard's like a deeper league three-point option. Then the rest of their roster, it's Sam Hauser. Maybe he plays. Luke Cornett, he's either backup center. Noah Vonley, top, former top 10 pick, who's just never been good. Kevin Gale, really fantasy-friendly player. Watch for him. If he can push out Cornett or Vonley. Vonley, I don't know why I said it that way. Jake Lehman's bad. Gallinari's out for the whole season. JD Davison, a two-way guy. Him and Kevin Gale are the two-way guys. Davison had some struggles in college, but he really put up some good summer league numbers. But... With Smart, White, Brogdon, Pritchard ahead of him, he is just not going to play. We'll keep a track on what he does for the Red Claws. Are they still called the Red Claws or are they called the main Celtics now? I don't know. Anyway, their G League team. We'll keep an eye on him and see what he does there, but he's just not going to play. And they've also got Bruno Caboclo. I don't think they keep Caboclo on the roster. It's going to be between him, Lehman, and Von Ley. Probably they keep two of those guys, maybe, maybe one, and then cycle in some other guys on that roster. But they're all back-end, wing size players. But we talk about their lack of forwards. Von Le, Lehman, Caboclo are all forwards. They're all bad. And I think Hauser probably does get the look ahead ahead of those players. And that will do it for a Boston Celtics fantasy look ahead to this season. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. Here on YouTube, thumb it up. Leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.